Good morning. Um, I can see various people are, are joining now from the waiting room. Uh, thank you very much indeed um, for um, attending this um, webinar on the hot off the press judgment at the Supreme Court in Hillside and Snowdonia National Park Authority. Um, my name is, is Charlie Banner, um, KC. Uh, I'm barrister at Keating Chambers. Uh, I know a number of the people um, on this uh, webinar. I can see some lots of familiar names and, and some names I don't know. So thank you all for, for coming. Um, I was the uh, counsel for um, Hillside Parks in the Supreme Court, um, not in the courts below. Um, and so I've had the privilege of uh, knowing what the outcome was, but not being able to tell anybody about it until this morning. And so I thought it might help based upon that uh, advanced knowledge to um, prepare these slides and talk you through the uh, key aspects of the judgment. I imagine most of you uh, now know what the verdict was. Um, but um, for those of you who don't, appeal dismissed. Um, with somewhat of a surprise to those, most of those who... Um, watched the proceedings uh, where the, the majority of the court, with one exception, seemed to be very interested in the appellant's arguments. Um, but the appeal was dismissed and the lead judgment of, of Lord Sales and Lord Leggett with the other judges um, not providing any additional judgments of their own. Um, I'm not going to today offer a critique of the Supreme Court's judgment. I don't think it'd be appropriate for me as counsel in the case to do so. I'm sure there'll be a, a number of people who have their own views on the um, judgment and will be expressing those views in due course. And I'm also, um, the purpose of this webinar isn't really to delve into the background. I've got one slide on the background, but not to delve into the background of the history of the case, how the arguments um, were put forward, etc. Um, what I really want to do for today's purposes, with whilst the judgment is so fresh, is to um, give you what I think are the key headline messages for the judgment looking forward, and then pull that together at the end um, with uh, some initial thoughts, and I stress they are only initial given the judgment is um, so recent, on where that leaves us and where that leaves the planning uh, sector. Um, so but I do stress the, uh, the caveat that uh, these are provisional thoughts for the reasons I've given. Um, it'd be interesting to know also um, whether people think um, that the fact that the uh, now, the eight judges who've heard this case, not one of them have done a planning inquiry. Uh, they weren't specialist planners. Is that a good thing? Does that mean that the, the courts have um, avoided groupthink on and corrected a uh, industry misunderstanding? Uh, or, or is it problematic? Uh, that would be for others uh, to decide. Um, I am going to take questions. There's a QA and a um, box, I believe. Um, I'll, I'll do that at the end simply because I'm sharing my screen at the moment and it's difficult for me to see the Q&A, so I'll have some time at the end. I will try, and that will be an experiment, to um, bring anybody up on screen who would like to ask a question uh, on the screen to make it a bit more interactive at the end. I can't promise I'll be able to do the tech there because it's the first time. Anyway, um, so by way of background, just to put context on the, um, uh, the headline messages from the court, um, Hillside concerned a planning permission granted in 1967 um, for um, 401 units. Slightly alarmed that uh, Zoom has, has turned off and on, so I'm not quite sure whether um, uh, whether the last bit was captured. But anyway, there's a judgment in 1987 by Mr Justice Drake holding that the permissions between 67 and 87 did, um, hadn't meant that the uh, 67 permission was incapable of further implementation. There were then after 1987, consistently with that earlier practice, localised departures again from the master plan, uh, pursuant to additional planning permissions, um, and most of those additional permissions post-87 used the words um, variation of and then reference the 1967 permission. So on their terms, most of those permissions were expressed to vary the development under the original permission. Not all of them, though. Um, His Honour Judge Kayser, at first instance, um, held that Mr Justice Drake had been entitled to find that the 1967 permission was, as of 1987, capable of further implementation, because the 67 permission could still be built out substantially in accordance with the master plan, despite the pre-87 permissions. And there was no cross-appeal in, in the later proceedings that led to the Supreme Court case uh, by the authority challenging His Honour Judge Keyser's findings in this respect. Um, 
However, what the High Court did find was that the implementation of the post-1987 permissions did preclude further implementation of the original consent, and the Court of Appeal upheld that. And that was the finding that was before the Supreme Court for consideration. And what Hillside sought to advocate the Supreme Court was this proposition in, in uh, headline, whether a successive permissions relating to the same site and the later permission or permissions are for lo localised focus changes, colloquially known as drop-ins, to a wider development approved in the original consent. The effect of implementing later permissions is that the original consent becomes unimplementable only in relation to the areas affected by the later permissions. Live and let live, in other words, rather than live and let die. So really the first critical slide um, is the first headline from the Supreme Court's judgment, which relates to the so-called Pilkington principle. Pilkington being a case at first instance, um, uh, many years ago in the early 70s, in first instance before three judge divisional court, um, and that concerned the relationship between uh, uh, mutually inconsistent uh, planning permissions for development on the same site. Um, the principle set out in that case was upheld by the Supreme Court, so now it has the force of the highest court in the land, and upheld in its purest sense. The court interpreted Pilkington as meaning that where a later permission means it's physically impossible, and those words are important, physically impossible to implement an earlier permission, the earlier permission can no longer be relied upon. Um, the, the analogy that uh, the appellant sought to make between Pilkington and abandonment was rejected. Um, the analogy was essentially that though um, Pilkington wasn't a form of uh, abandonment per se, uh, the, where the principle of abandonment does apply in limited aspects of planning, one um, considers uh, whether um, uh, based upon both objective and subjective considerations, it would be reasonable to think that the uh, landowner had abandoned uh, reliance on their earlier use rights. And the point was made, well, in the uh, drop-in hillside type concept context, it can't sensibly be said either on an objective or subjective basis that there was an intention to do away with the earlier permission. And so that analogy was put forward as justifying the proposition advanced by hillside. The court um, uh, rejected that argument. However, it um, caveated the Pilkington principle in two important ways. Firstly, um, the physical impossibility of constructing the development, which would be fatal um, to reliance on the early permission, uh, was to be contrasted with mere incompatibility with the two or more permissions, which isn't fatal. Now, what does that mean in practice? They referred to an earlier judgment um, where uh, there were two planning permissions for don't on the same site. The earlier one had a condition relating to the retention of trees. And the later one involved development, um, which would require the removal of those trees. The later permission was implemented. That didn't preclude reliance on the earlier one because the development authorised by the earlier permission could still be built out. It was just a condition of it that was no longer capable of being complied with but the actual development was still physical, physically possible to complete. Um, so that case was a, an instance of mere incompatibility, not fatal to reliance on both permissions, to be contrasted with Pilkington, where uh, the first permission was for a single house on the land in a small holding. The second permission was for a house on another part of the land, which meant that the first permission, which was for a single house and a small holding, could no longer be uh, relied upon it was physically possible to have a small holding and therefore the first mission fell away. And the second important caveat the Supreme Court placed on the Pilkington principle was that non-material departures from the earlier permission, even if there's physical impossibility, non-material departures are not fatal. They came back to that late in the judgment. I'll deal with that in more detail under headline five. The second headline concerns uh, the way the Supreme Court looked at a, um, a, a case called Lucas. Lucas was a, a case that actually predated Pilkington. And uh, in that case, uh, Mr Justice Wynne, at first instance, had held in the context of, of a development for uh, what the Supreme Court described a multi-unit scheme, um, he held that that permission authorised not one overall development, which was an overall whole, but a number of independent acts of development. Each, essentially each house was a separate act of development 
uh, which had an independent consent by that permission, meaning that um, the inability to build out some elements of that overall development didn't mean the permission was incapable of further reliance because the bits that couldn't be built out were severable. Effectively, the developer could pick and choose which bits the developer could, could build out. Um, and the Supreme Court held that that judgment was wrongly decided. The Court of Appeal had sat on the fence a bit and said it's confined to its own facts. The Supreme Court didn't meet mince its words. They held that it was wrong. Um, however, it, it was caveat. The Supreme Court did say, and this is important when we come back at the end to look at where the position now is, the Supreme Court did say that um, its finding in relation to Lucas-type permissions was subject to any what it called contraindication in the Planning Commission. That's a paragraph 50 of the judgment. I'm not going to risk toggling the judgment on and off the slides, given the technical issues with, with Zoom, but um, the judgment is available on the Supreme Court website. And it's paragraph 50 where the court made very clear that a planning commission could, in principle, authorise uh, Lucas-type independent acts of development, but only where it expressly provided so in the clearest terms. Um, and um, the court did reject, too, the suggestion by the Court of Appeal and the respondent in the Hillside case that um, the effect of Lucas being wrong uh, was that a multi-unit development needed to be completed entirely in order to be lawful. The court um, was very emphatic in that respect. Mr. Lord Justice Singh had left open the question, and indeed the respondent, the authority, had actually submitted positively that a development was unlawful and subject to enforcement if it was incomplete, which raised the prospect of Mr. and Mrs. Smith on phase one of a five-phase development potentially liable to enforcement action against their home if the developer went bankrupt and never was able to build out phase five. A very unsatisfactory aspect of the Court of Appeal judgment and one which, thankfully, the Supreme Court um, corrected. It corrected that aspect of the judgment too in relation to the reliance of the courts below and the respondent on SAGE. SAGE was a case in the House of Lords um, in the early 2000s uh, where uh, the, the case concerned the building of a house without any planning permission at all. And the, de the developer, Mr Sage in that case, said that the time for enforcement action, the four-year uh, time limitations that there was, ran not from when the house was actually complete, um, but when uh, he'd finished doing all those works which in themselves required planning permission. So internal works, which came at the end, um, he could do, he, they don't necessarily need planning permission if they were internal works to a um, uh, to a house which was uh, immune from enforcement action or which had planning permission. Um, and so he said, well, once the shell was complete, even if the internal works, which didn't need permission in themselves, hadn't been completed, um, the, the time started and therefore the authority was out of time for planning permission, for planning enforcement. And the House of Lords rejected that argument, said essentially one has to take a holistic approach and the time starts when the development as a whole is finished. Um, and, and obviously right in, in that context. Um, and Mr Justice Hickenbottom had in a case called Singh applied that to the Pilkington context uh, and suggested what that meant was that if a development that had permission uh, couldn't be fully completed because of a later permission came along that did something uh, different on part of the site, then the whole development was unlawful. So a different way of making the same point that had been made by reference to the Lucas case. Uh, with the same consequences for Mr and Mrs Jones in phase, what, phase one of a five-phase development. And the Supreme Court rejected that part of the respondent's case uh, and indeed uh, the analysis of the courts below. Uh, Lord Sales uh, and Lord Leggett noted that Sage was a very different case on its facts. In fact, Pilkening wasn't even cited in uh, Sage. It was about enforcement in relation to a single building constructed without planning permission, not about the Pilkerton principle in relation to multiple unit developments, which did have planning permission. Um, and so they held that uh, there was no principle that a multi-unit development might be vulnerable to enforcement action uh, unless and until it was complete. Uh, so that aspect of the Supreme Court's judgment, in relation to which the appellant was successful, um, will come as a relief to the development industry, albeit perhaps scant consolation for other aspects of the judgment.
So pulling together the court's analysis of Pilkett and Lucas and Sage, the key summary paragraph in the judgment of Lord Sales and Leggett is paragraph 68, where they said in summary, failure or inability to complete a project for which permission has been granted doesn't make development carried out pursuant to permission unlawful, but, and I bolded these words, in the absence of clear express provision making it severable, a planning permission isn't to be construed as authorising further development if at any stage compliance with the permission becomes physically impossible. So pause now there. That's a very important passage of the judgment um, summarising the three headline points that I've um, outlined so far. I said earlier on that the court's findings in relation to Pilkington uh, were subject to two provisos, one of which was that de departures from the first consent, physical impossibilities must be material in order to mean that the first consent can't be um, relied upon. And that's covered in particular paragraph 69 of the judgment, where the court held that um, Pilkington doesn't mean a later permission precludes reliance on the earlier one, unless there's exact compliance with the earlier permission. Uh, the court said the ordinary presumption must be that the departure will have this effect only if it is material in the context of the scheme as a whole. That's similar, different language, but similar at least to the substantial accordance or substantial compliance approach of his Honor Judge Keyser. The court then went on at paragraph 70 to deal with section 96, should we say section 96A and non-material amendments. And they said... Um, this approach didn't undermine the provision to apply in advance for an NMA of a planning permission um, because um, uh, they said the, um, the developer, if it doesn't apply for an NMA in advance, was obviously at risk of losing reliance on the earlier permission because it wouldn't know whether the departure was or was, wasn't uh, material until the local authority decided if it did to take enforcement action. It didn't say so in terms in 69 and 70, but it seems to me that the clear implication of the court's analysis of 69 and 70 is that the, the scope uh, of the uh, minor departure um, proviso to the Pilkington principle is, is, was seen as essentially the same as the scope for an NMA under section 96A. That's how, in my view, the court um, uh, treated it. So effectively, you could apply in advance for an NMA, or if you don't, and you um, you do it as, as a drop-in type scenario, a later permission, it, the, the, uh, the later permission must have the effect of an NMA, otherwise the Pilkington principle is engaged. Um, so that probably means that the, the scope for a later permission that doesn't vary the whole scheme as to which I'll come on to before, the later permission to work with an earlier permission as opposed to replace it entirety, entirely is a lot more limited uh, than previously thought is effectively the same as an NMA. But the court did say there could be variation. So later permission could have the effect of varying a development authorised by an earlier permission, provided it relates to the scheme as a whole. And, and I've quoted the key, some key parts of the analysis. So the court noted a paragraph 70 that I submitted on behalf of Hillside that it would be caused serious practical inconvenience if a developer who, when carrying out a large development, encounters a local difficulty or wishes for other reasons to depart from the approved scheme in one particular area of the site, if they can't go and get permission to do so without losing the benefit of the whole permission and having to apply for a fresh permission for the main development on other parts of the site. So in other words, the drop-in approach, as previously understood by the planning industry, um, was far more convenient than going back to apply for permission for the development as a whole, with the full red line, uh, all that involved uh, because of some uh, local difficulty. The court didn't deny that was inconvenient, but the court's view was that's the legal position. Whereas here, a developer has been granted a full permission for one entire scheme, wants to depart from it in a material way. It's a consequence of very limited powers that currently are to change an existing permission. And then the court sought to um, suggest, nonetheless, the practical consequences were limited because they said there's no reason why an approved development scheme can't be modified by an appropriately framed additional permission, which covers the whole site and includes the necessary modifications. 
Um, so in other words, you could uh, achieve the same result, the court thought, as a drop-in by an appropriately framed additional permission, which covers the whole site and includes necessary modifications. The developer then has two permissions relating to the whole site and is entitled to proceed under the second. So in that scenario, the Pilkerton principle would apply. The later permission would effectively replace the earlier permission pursuant to the, the Pilkerton principle and would be from then on the governing permission for the whole site, as opposed to a drop-in scenario when you've got a later focused permission, which works alongside an earlier permission. That is still possible where the later permission is for non-material change, but for material change, the, amend the, the later permission has to be for the whole site incorporating the change. Um, they rejected the submission of the authority, uh, uh, the National Park Authority, as a respondent that a later permission can't have that effect and can't modify an earlier permission. They agreed a later permission could, but it had to relate to the whole site. Then at 76, they said, in order for permission to be a variation in that way, uh, ordinarily it would have to be accompanied by a plan which showed how the proposed new permission incorporated the changes into a coherent design for the whole site. So simply using the word variation, the Supreme Court thought wasn't enough to show how the new permission ought to work with the earlier ones. And that was fatal for the hillside on its facts. And then they said this, where an application for a variation of a previous permission is properly regarded as an application for press permission as a whole site. So in other words, where you do it in the way the Supreme Court thought you could have a, a modification to the whole site, incorporating the variation in the context of the earlier development. That may, of course, mean the application is required to be accompanied by certain documentation relevant to the whole site, such as EIA. Where the variation is comparatively minor and circumstances haven't changed, it may be possible to reuse or update such documentation. Whether this is possible will depend on the circumstances. So the Supreme Court appeared to think that the practical inconvenience of having to reapply for anything that was a material change, reapply for permission for the whole site, the practical implications could be limited because you could recycle earlier documentation. Um, and so I won't comment on the merits of the judgment. I'll leave it to others to decide whether um, a judge with planning experience might have reached a different view. Um, then headline um, seven, pulling this uh, together in the context of the facts of Hillside, in particular the post-1987 permissions, um, the permissions post-1987, I say largely, most of them, were described in their terms as variations to the original consent. Um, and yet the Supreme Court found they weren't variations and therefore the reliance on them by the developer, rather than varying the original consent, lost the original consent. Why did the Supreme Court hold that? Because they weren't, in, in the judge's view, um, the, the, the development was substantially at variance from what was shown in the master, master plan. So they were not minor, but substantial amendments. Uh, and they didn't have plans showing how they integrated with the rest of the development, meaning that therefore they couldn't be read as the necessary kind of permission for a non-material change, and namely a permission that applied to the site as a whole, subject to the change, as opposed to a focused localised permission that was to work with the earlier consent. And again, you can only work with the earlier consent if it's a, uh, a non-material uh, change. That's, that's why the Supreme Court held that despite the term used, uh, in fact, uh, the developer by implementing a mission that purported to vary the early consent, lost the ability to rely on the early consent. Um, the, uh, interestingly, the court held that the permit, none of the permissions were to be interpreted having read the planning history. They said that the reasonable reader uh, of a planning permission would, unless there was an express contraindication in the terms of the permission, would re read the permission on its own terms, ignorant of the planning history. Uh, it, it will be interesting to see to what extent that um, uh, that affects the practice in certainly most office report of citing the planning history. Is that does that really? Have, to what extent does that matter? It may matter to the planning merits, but it certainly doesn't matter to the interpretation of the permission anymore, uh, if it ever did. Um, the court um, 
heard a submission from me on behalf of Hillside that in relation to the um, the principal permission that didn't use the word variation, which was for three units, and it's by reference to a plot number used in the master plan. The submission was made that the reasonable reader wouldn't interpret uh, a permission for such a small amount of development, which referenced the 67 master plan. It wouldn't interpret that as an alternative to the entire development, as opposed to interpreting it as a variation. The Supreme Court said, no, it was a permission that stood in its own terms. And by implementing a permission for three units in that location, which meant that um, the 67 master plan was physically impossible in that location, implementing those three units would have on its, on its own terms have lost the ability to build out the rest of the 401 unit development. That's an indication of the strictness of the principle identified by the Supreme Court. Um, a submission was made um, uh, in both writing and orally that any difficulties that there may be in marrying up modifications to a wider scheme so that the overall whole was coherent would be for the local authority to consider at the time of granting an additional consent. So if in relation to any uh, application for permission for focused localised change, one of the material considerations, a very material consideration for the authority would be, does this match up in a satisfactory way to the rest of the wider scheme? And that uh, the, the better way of looking at uh, how this worked in law was for the local authority to deal with that at the time as a material consideration. And if it didn't uh, deal with it adequately, then so subject to judicial review at the time. And in the absence of judicial review, that decision had to be given all the effects in law of a valid decision and it couldn't be collaterally challenged later. Um, that was a key part of the case. That wasn't actually dealt with by the Supreme Court, um, but one has to infer that they didn't agree with that submission um, for whatever reason. Um, and then wrapping that together, so I probably will, well, I'll try and risk screen squaring now because it's the last uh, but one slide. Hopefully you can see paragraph 100. So the overall conclusion, the courts were right below to hold the 67 permission was a permission to carry out a single scheme of development on the, on the relevant site. It, it can't be construed as separately permitting particular parts of the scheme to be built alongside the development on site authorised by later independent permissions. It's possible in principle for an LPA to grant a permission which approves a modification of an entire scheme rather than constituting a separate permission referable just part of the scheme. The permissions in this case weren't such a um, uh, weren't to be interpreted in such a way. The development uh, implemented makes it physically impossible to develop the site in accordance with the master plan in a material way. So that was the overall conclusion. Back to the slide, which I'll just go back there. Hopefully you can see that. So uh, implications. So these are, my, again, my, I, I do stress, these are my initial um, thoughts only. Um, express words in a master permission. So if you're actually in a process of applying for, or as a local authority, considering whether to grant a permission for a multi-unit development, a large multi-phase development that may be subject to the need to tweak um, in, uh, in due course, the Supreme Court did say express words in a master permission can still make individual components of development severable. So in other words, you, you might still be able to future proof a large consent from some of these issues, at least by uh, using express words to make elements severable. So that then if, if a particular part didn't end up being built out in the way envisaged, that wouldn't be fatal to the rest. Um, so um, that's one saving grace. However, it's very clear from the terms of the court's judgment that um, this is unlikely to be inferred where there's any ambiguity. You would need the most express words. Um, secondly, a part completed development isn't unlawful, not subject to enforcement, contrary to the suggestion of the respondent and contrary to um, uh, what had been uh, mooted, albeit not definitively, by the Court of Appeal. Where implementing permission B, which I use by, as a shorthand for a later permission, where implementing permission B means that any of the development authorised by permission A is physically impossible, permission A can't be further relied upon unless the incompatibility is not material in the context of the scheme as a whole. That is the same or a similar test to section 96A NMAs. Not to be confused with mere inconsistency, 
for example, the condition about retention of trees. It's got to be the, the development authorised by the first consent being physically impossible. Permission B can, however, be interpreted as authorising a variation to permission A, but only if permission B covers the whole site. And to interpret it thus, it needs ordinarily to be accompanied by a plan which shows how the new permission incorporates the changes into a coherent design for the whole site. In that situation, the governing perm permission for the whole site will be permission B on its own. There would be no question of one working alongside the other. It would replace the earlier permission as the governing document in planning terms for the whole site. Um, there may be well be some practical implications in relation to EIA and Section 106 that perhaps are more problematic than the Supreme Court um, appeared to think they would be by, by virtue of the need to apply for permission on the whole site. Um, Section 73, as was made clear to the Supreme Court, but again, not something they referenced expressly in their judgment, Section 73 uh, may not be particularly helpful in many of these contexts because the effect of the Finney case is that the description of development uh, can't be changed to Section 73, so it's going to have to be a, a, a fresh Section 70 planning permission. Um, one would hope that for developments which are already underway, um, uh, where which may now be caught by Hillside, um, where it was at least anticipated by the parties concerned that um, the use of a drop-in was um, appropriate and acceptable, one would hope local authorities will be pragmatic in relation to enforcement, and of course, time limits for enforcement uh, may well become important. So those are some initial thoughts. I'm sure there'll be further thoughts. I'll go through some of the questions people have asked in the text. Um, so Nicholas asked, do we think a phasing condition constitutes just clear express provision of severability? It's a very good question. Um, it depends on the, I think it probably does depend upon the, um, uh, upon how the phasing condition and or provision for phasing is, is phrased. Um, I think it's likely um, that you're going to need something in the description of development and not simply a condition for a phasing plan, et cetera, and certainly not something in 106, uh, advice on, on, the, on the ability of 106 to uh, avoid Pilkerton issues in the past. And it seems to me as 106 isn't part of the planning commission but works with it, that wouldn't be enough. So I think you're probably going to have to have um, longer descriptions of development, more elaborate descriptions of development that um, may even want to use the word severable. Uh, to start off with, at least, until at least we get some further clarity from perhaps the High Court as to what does and doesn't constitute an express provision. But I, I would say the more express, the better. Uh, remove as many scope, uh, many as much scope for doubt as possible. Um, then, uh, Robert, you've asked, does the, the Supreme Court's solution for the appropriately framed additional permission of the whole site, does that now exclude amending the um, original consent under section 73's 96A to slot out. Um, that may still work in some cases. It, it makes it more difficult, but I think if you could, um, certainly under 196A, if you could um, effectively create um, some white land in a larger consent, which then would mean something could be dropped in. Potentially that would work because effectively if you amended the original consent um, under section 96A or amended it in inverted commas under section 73 so that the permission A effectively uh, no longer envisaged any development on part of the site, then there wouldn't be a physical impossibility between that and the later one. So there may still be um, scope for slotting out and dropping in. Clearly, the utmost care must be required, and the litmus test is going to be physical impossibility of building out the uh, physical development authorised by the original consent as Section 73 or in Section 96 aid. So potentially slot out and drop in may work, um, depending on the nature of the development. Um, the larger the scheme, the easier it probably is going to be, but equally the more the more likely is these issues are going to arise because the bigger the development, the longer the longer the development um, is likely to 
opaque uh, and therefore the uh, greater the scope for things to change during the course of the development being rolled out. Um, I'm just scrolling down the questions in the order they come up on my screen. So um, Kevin has asked about what if you have physically identical buildings with different land uses within them? Would that be captured under physical impossibility? That is, again, is, is another extremely good question, one which the, was actually dealt what well, mentioned before the court, was left unanswered. Um, I want to think about that, to be quite honest. I wouldn't want to give it a definitive view. I can see some scope for arguing that um, physically identical buildings but different uses didn't engage the principle because there's no physical impossibility. It's a conceptual, <laughs> a, use of a, different, a conflicting use but physical identi identicality. So that may well be okay, Kevin. Um, but again, uh, tread very carefully because the Supreme Court's made very clear that it's not going to be persuaded um, to take a particular um, interpretation of law based upon what works for the development industry. Um, it, it, it's going to be um, fairly black letter about the legal position, but I can see the force in your suggestion. Um, Drop an application for temporary use, Justin's asked, as if it's temporary use. I don't think so myself. I've always taken the view that temporary uses, because of the way you have a reverter under Section 57, I think it is from memory, um, temporary uses probably don't engage the Pilkington principle. Again, subject to the usual caveat that further thought needs to be given in light of the Supreme Court's hot of the press judgment. But I think probably a temporary permission would avoid the full force of this principle. Uh, would an addendum pause off? Would addendum of the F be sufficient rather than a whole new document? Um, it probably depends how recent the um, uh, what the what the duration and time is between the original consent and the um, modifying consent of the kind referred to the Supreme Court in Section seventy four. If it's in the slipstream of the original consent, then an addendum may very well be acceptable. Um, you can see problems where, uh, you know, if you've got something, there's a 10 or 15 year project um, and something crops up needing a paragraph 74, as I might call it, a Supreme Court paragraph 74 permission for an amendment, but it has to be for the whole site. Um, something crops up 15 years later, um, you could see a local authority insisting on on a full yes in that situation, or it may be a full yes, but on particular issues in relation to those issues that have changed. Um, and you can see certainly that um, people are going to have to make scoping um, opinion requests uh, in relation to yes. So if, if an yes is needed, um, what does that yes need to cover? Um, so I think it will probably depend upon the extent of the change and the extent of lapse in time. Um, lots of questions. I hope I can answer as many of them as possible. Um, uh, what about Section 1? I don't think Section 106 is likely to make much of a difference because, as I said, Section 106 isn't part of the planning permission. Implications for DCO projects, I'm going to pass on that because I haven't had a time to think about it. But um, broadly speaking, the principles are probably likely to be the same or similar, but at the same time, the bigger the project, and obviously DCO projects are larger, are larger generally speaking, uh, the bigger the project, um, the easier it may be to say that a later permission um, can, can work with an earlier one um, because the amendment isn't material. Because remember, the, the Supreme Court used the language material in the context of the scheme as a whole. So the proportionality and uh, I had to use a housing example. Obviously, if there's if it's ten if it's ten dwelling de uh, development, then changes to one dwelling may well be material. If it's a ten thousand dwelling, probably not. So proportionality is is relevant. That may well be of importance in the context of DT, uh, DCO. Um, Cheryl, I'm glad that you. I'm not the only one with IT issues. I see. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Uh, and. Oh, got lots and lots of questions. Do you know what? There's, I'm going to have to scroll down a bit because there's some, um, hundreds of questions here now. Um, let me see. If permission A is rendered incapable of further implementation, if permission B is a material change, that means construction on permission A would need to stop if not all of it were completed. Um, yes, um, unless uh, the developer was able to get a consent 
Uh, well, it wouldn't need to stop because obviously it would be subject to enforcement action if the local authority wanted to enforce. The prudent thing to do in that scenario would be to get a rectifying permission. And I should add, I mean, I'll probably conclude here, otherwise we could literally be here all day. Um, but I think I would conclude by <coughs> saying this, that of course in some situations, um, local authorities may very well be pragmatic and the enforcement risk is it will be low because if in reality the local authority has consented um, A plus A uh, permission B, which was intended by everybody to work with A, uh, on that understanding, but now falls foul of the Supreme Court, unless there's been some important change in policy or circumstances, why wouldn't they grant permission for the rest of the first development again and rectify the situation? Um, the difficulty with Hillside on its facts was that though um, the site was always in Snowdonia National Park from, from the outset of proceedings, that um, regulation of development in the National Park had got uh, tighter and tighter over the years, to the point where now the chances of getting a, a new 401 dwelling, uh, development authorised national park, certainly in most places, that national park would be slim. Uh, and, and therefore, um, the authority took the view that um, it was able to take a different stance on the merits. So it may very well be in a lot of contexts, uh, there's a theoretically increased risk. We may have all sorts of issues for funding, etc. Again, a point made by the Supreme Court, but um, not one which they found persuasive. We have all sorts of issues for funding, but actually in terms of real, actual risk, um, quite low. And it may be in some situations it would be worth, worth those of you who are or who act for developers um, to consider what could be done to regularise the permission proactively to avoid any, um, any concerns of enforcement. I think I'm going to do so many questions. I'd, I'd love to be here all day uh, and take them all. Uh, all I can say, two concluding thoughts. Uh, we're covering this on Have We Got Planning News for You uh, tomorrow uh, at five o'clock. So I'll try and deal with um, a few other points that any, by always email me any, any questions you may have too. I'm sure most of you got my email, cbanner at keatingchambers.com. I'll try and see if I can answer some of the un unanswered questions on Have We Got Planning News for You tomorrow. Uh, and lastly, I did say on the... Um, uh, on the, my LinkedIn post, obviously no charge for today. Uh, but if anyone did want to make a donation to my Ukraine humanitarian fund, there's details of that on LinkedIn, and that would be hugely appreciated. Thank you to all of you who have done already. Um, with that, um, I will say goodbye. Um, I would say happy reading. I'm not sure it will be happy reading for everybody uh, in the planning industry, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what others make of it. Um, goodbye, and thank you very much again. <laughs>